St. Joseph. Um, Deputy Speaker, it is interesting how the Minister of Finance has chosen to shroud a debate on the Barbados Sustainable Recovery Plan in the estimates for the financial year 2018 to 2019. The annual estimates debate, Madam Deputy Speaker, is one which allows Parliament the chance to delve into the way in which government proposes to spend its money. And the occasion of these speeches would generally allow members to home in on exactly those things because, as we all know, when we get into the um, other speeches, we would be looking at specific heads. So we would ordinarily be discussing issues, though not too dissimilar. We would generally be talking about the financial program of the government for the year ahead. But the Minister of Finance has very craftily, I think, chosen, yes, craftily, chosen to debate this sustainable recovery plan. And it seems, it seems really as though this discussion will divert our attention away from the estimates and try to get us to look at a long-term plan. But I have to begin by saying, Madam Deputy Speaker, that none of us on this side have any confidence in this 2018 plan. I don't think that there is a single businessman or businesswoman, a commercial entity, a member of any board of directors, an investor, and a, a housewife. I don't think there is a single person who has any confidence in this plan, in part, Madam Deputy Speaker, because we've had many plans put on the table by this government before. Every estimate, the Minister of Finance comes with a plan. Every budget speech, he comes with yet another plan. And we've also had various committees and special groups of advisors who, in the past, have helped to formulate plans for this recovery for Barbados, and nothing of it has ever crystallized. So why would we, Madam Deputy Speaker, 22 days before Parliament dies, perhaps less than 22 days before an election is announced, how could honestly this Parliament be expected to commend any recovery plan that is <laughs> thrown at our feet almost as a desperation measure? You know, the Minister of Finance has praised the fact that the members of the Social Partnership have appended their hands and seals to this document. And I was very curious because I had expected that when I looked to see what the Social Partnership members said, I was expecting that there would be some positive statements of affirmation about the plan. Perhaps it is my failing that I earn a living in part through words, because I will frequently look to see what is said and then look to see what is not said. Madam Deputy Speaker, if you look, if you look at what the Private Sector Association has said, you really have to ask if even they have any confidence. They have said in the opening paragraph that they believe the plan presents an opportunity to chart the recovery. Fair enough, every plan provides that. But at the end, at the end of their note, they praise the oversight committee and they conclude by saying that this document represents an improvement in the collaboration of the social partners which we should strive to further develop and build on in the future. That's it. So for the Private Sector Association, this document really serves as a demonstration of a collaborative effort. Well, 
well, sir, when you look at what C2 Sahab said, they didn't say very much different. They said the plan is a result of rigorous discussions, but in their concluding paragraph, they too say that the Congress believes that the formulation and implementation of the recovery plan will strengthen the collaborative mechanisms and the workers' union. Again, in none of these notes can one glean the slightest bit of acclamation for this plan. It is almost, Madam Deputy Speaker, as if they have been dragged pen in hand and said, look, sign this here, because we got to put this out in the public domain. That's what it is. That's what it is. None of these individuals have given the slightest bit of testimonial for this plan. It reminds me of that poem by Yeats, where the most famous line is perhaps, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, unlike the members on that side, I've taken the trouble of reading the plan. I have. And the first thing that you notice, the first thing that you, well, this parliament is accustomed to sending things to parliamentarians late. They're unmannerly like that. It came last Friday, and we are here on Monday. And I have read it. And the member for St. Lucy would do well to open the book and read the first sentence. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, when you look at the plan, you will see, um, I have to tell you though, let me compliment the government, the government designers, because yeah. this plan deserves 100% for artwork and graphics. <laughs> it is 100 pages, exactly 100 pages, not a page more. It is, it is so fancy, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the appendix is in the middle. The, the index is in the middle. The first half is just words, the second half is tables and graphs and appendices. But when you look at the tongue planning, because I really thought that we were going to see something novel, something new, something which would say to Barbadians that this government has finally grasped, finally grasped the direction that we have to go in. And we realize it is the same cold soup warmed up. Because when you look at the section on the tongue planner, at year 10 of their term, they say that they want to develop a mechanism to reduce the time to less than six months to get a construction permit in Barbados. Now, I have to tell you, language is an important thing. Nobody in Barbados talks about construction permits, but this government is known for getting things prepared outside the country, and they use foreign jargon. Has anybody in here heard of anybody talking about a construction permit? We talk about town planning permissions, not construction permits. Mm -hmm. But you all make that mistake all the time, keep doing it. But six months, they wait till year 10, with 22 days to go, to tell the country that part of their sustainable recovery plan is to reduce planning permissions to six months. Mm -hmm. Good Lord. They wait until year 10 to come up with this. How many sets of rigorous discussions did they really have to engage in to come up with this? Especially since, especially since, in the year 2007, the Department of the Town Planning, when it was headed by the former Prime Minister, member for St. Peter, said in its charter that they were going to reduce the length of time for planning applications to six months. So it was said in 2007, it is part of the charter that they produced, but in, 20, in 2018, the, tongue, the, you know, the government is, is throwing this at our feet as being something that is novel. But oh Lord, sir, they say, they say that they're going to rescue Barbados by enhancing growth foreign exchange earnings and employment opportunities through investments in road infrastructure projects. Now, to tell you the truth, I have never seen so much tar go down in Barbados so fast than in the last two weeks. I haven't seen much in St. Joseph, but such as they have sent, I am grateful for. But this is objective number 15, enhance growth, foreign exchange earnings, and employment opportunities 
through investments in road infrastructure projects. But when you look at the details, Madam Deputy Speaker, it refers to a CAF loan for $4 million to be utilized in four tranches. I thought that we were going to see 50 million, 80 million, 100 million even. But $4 million. $4 million. Now, sir, what this tells me, oh, and the best one of all is your sugar factory. The yeah, yeah, yeah. best one of all, because they shut down Andrew Sugar Factory about six years ago. Get everybody in Barbados to plant river tamarind all up and down Barbados. Thousands of acres of river tamarind. Shut down Andrew Sugar Factory. Told the world that we were going to build a $500 million factory. And yet at page 35 of this plan, there's a statement. There's a reference to the same sugar factory. And it has in brackets, the size and nature of this venture is yet to be determined. Six years after they shut down the sugar factory in St. Joseph, they are now telling Barbados that as part of their sustainable recovery plan 2018, that the size and nature of the sugar factory is still to be determined. So what do we have, Madam Deputy Speaker? We have a Barbados Never mind all the glowing descriptions by the Minister of Finance. As we stand in this chamber, there are people in Fairtrail Street bus stand since 4 o'clock. There are school children who are in that bus stand since before 4 o'clock. And you can guarantee, Madam Deputy Speaker, that they will not get a bus home until 7 o'clock if they are lucky. We, we have a big green book. We have a big green book and a, and a, a pretty book that like it made of the Christmas paper, the one that got left over that wasn't used because nobody had money to buy gifts. And we have all, this, all these words. But there's nobody in St. Joseph or in St. Andrew or in St. Michael, St. Peter, St. Philip, there's nobody in this country who is able to identify with any of the numbers and the financial mumbo jumbo that is to be found in the estimates document or in the other document that they have now tried to slip in to get a debate out of the way. Because we are now reduced to a state where we are in survival mode. And when you are in survival mode, you have no, you don't have the luxury of getting into all of this sophisticated theory. Barbados is in desperate need of immediate solutions. But the government wants us to take a week of our time, days before we will be forced to end Parliament to debate these estimates. There is another saying that I would like to remind them of. I think the Prime Minister well knows Tacitus. And when they had created a wasteland, they called it civilization. As you drive across Barbados, Madam Deputy Speaker, as you must on your way making your frequent visits to St. John, you will see derelict buildings you will see roads that are not worthy of being described as roads. You will see mountains and mountains of trash, household garbage. They have now become a feature of not just our landscape, but a feature of our geography because the heaps of garbage are so high. You cannot even see the cans. So as you drive around this beautiful Barbados, that is exactly what it appears to you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It appears to be a wasteland. There are those of us who well remember what Barbados was like. And these estimates and this document should be focusing on those things which will allow us to return to the pride of place that Barbados had. But the Minister of Finance does not want to discuss the economy. 
He doesn't want to discuss any of these issues. He does not want to confront the fact that the leader of the opposition has posed on our behalf eight important questions which need answering. So permit me to remind the Minister of Finance of question number one. The country, not the Barbados Labour Party, the country wants to know what is the level of financial reserves today. The country also wants to know what is the level of the value-added tax and income tax, income and corporation tax refunds that are owed to Barbadian companies. The country wants to know what money does this government owe small businesses in Barbados? That is what it wants to know. Mr. Dep Madam Deputy Speaker, because at the end of all of this exercise, at the end of this entire exercise, if these questions are not answered, <coughs> then this parliament and the ministers who have been put in place to serve us will have failed in its duty to the people. The duty of a Minister of Finance is not just one of trying to shepherd the country's finances, you know. The Minister of Finance has to be in a position to inspire Barbadians with hope. He has to be able to tell Barbadians that the dream that we used to have is not lost. But every day, the country is being delivered another body blow. Whether it is coming from the Caribbean Development Bank, or Moody's, or the Caribbean Rating Agency, on and on. Every day, another body blow. And day after day, the Minister of Finance is entirely unable. Honorable Member for Crisis Central, would you allow it? The member to make his contribution, please. You know that Selenor School or Selenor problems in the schools? Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, you see, that, that is the problem that we have, you know. Because nobody believed that the Minister of Education would have, having been a former teacher himself, and a union president, and a union president would really have presided over a decline in the standards of our young people. Nobody would have believed it. Nobody would have believed it. But, but what is happening now, what is happening now, what is happening now, Madam Deputy Speaker, has to be laid at the feet of that minister. He will readily... Education will want to come into this chamber and heckle and try to stop other duly elected members from making a contribution to the chamber. If he wants, if he wants to behave in that way, then it is no wonder that we see indiscipline being demonstrated by young people at a significant level. Because they will see that the Minister of Education wants to conduct himself like a fagalash instead of affording his parliamentary colleagues the respect for their time and their endeavors. We have a young boy today in hospital. Critical. The victim of a stabbing. <laughs> Another stabbing last week. A stabbing the week before. What next? What next? So you know, you know, when when we talk about the wasteland, it's more than just the garbage on the streets. It's more than just the garbage on the streets, Madam Deputy Speaker. But we leave the Minister of Education alone. He is now helpless and gasping for breath. <laughs> We want to know, and the country wants to know, that having told us that in 2013 that cuts to employment were the only way 
to get out of the recession and having sent home 3,000 workers in 2014? What is the employment in central government and in the statutory corporations today? Mm -hmm. You see, we happen to know that at a time when the National Housing Corporation was totally insolvent, a Minister of Housing under this government could still find it possible to bring on 70 workers. The corporation was insolvent, could not pay its bills, but brought on 70 workers. The Rural Development Commission doubled in size from the, the level of employment that they had when the Barbados Labour Party was in power. It is doubled in size, but it is now only doing about $500,000 a, a year in work. So we want to know about this level of, what's the level of, of employment in the public service? Because it is clear to us, and you know, we're not fools, because people will be able to say, my neighbor going to work at National Housing Corporation. I thought the government said they were sending home people. But yet still at the NCC, people coming on. The people that you have been hiring almost in the dead of night, hopefully, to try and placate them on the even election. They go home so excited to get a paycheck that they tell all the friends. And then they run to Mr. Toppin's office, Mr. Toppin, you can get a job for me too. Are we glad for them? I'm glad for them, but you're not hiring them in secret. No point trying to hire them in secret. So you can't on the one hand say that we have to deal with the issue of transfers. You can't on the one hand say that we have to deal with the issue of transfers while bringing on so many people. The two things are not consonant. So tell us, what is the employment level in central government and the statutory corporations? The minister needs to tell us how he intends to create the room, the fiscal space, to be able to renew our crumbling infrastructure. Because this, this piffle, I don't know how to call it piffle, this piffle in this book, which talks about earning foreign exchange through building roads. I wonder, I wonder how they get in that do though. I'm not sure how you earn foreign exchange by building roads. <laughs> I'm having a little trouble with that. But um, you know, that, that telling us that you're getting $4 million US from a, from a CAF loan. I have roads in St. Joseph that the Ministry of Public Works are saying will take $5 million to fix. So if I got Rosa Sinjo that will take $5 million to fix, this $4 million loan isn't going to cut it. So tell us, Mr. Minister of Finance, how you intend to create the fiscal space to be able to provide the roads, the road infrastructure that we are accustomed to having. Let us not forget that the 2% NSR was imposed for the purpose of buying garbage trucks. That is what the Minister of Finance said in the budget of 2016. He imposed it for the purpose, among other things, of buying garbage trucks in 2016. Now, I don't know what happened. I don't know where the garbage truck money went. But in 2017, he increased it then to 10%. Still, to buy the same garbage trucks. And we're in 2018, and they haven't arrived yet. I don't know if the trucks that the BDF just got are going to be pressed into service, but the Minister of Finance has to be accountable for how he raises money, raises taxes on the backs of Barbadians, but still does not deliver what he promises to deliver, what he promises he will use the resources for. So the Minister who is responsible for sanitation needs to tell us whether he, in sanitation, has been able to get any of this money for the garbage trucks, because the garbage is still piled high. And the buses, as I said at the, at the time I began, there are people in the bus stand who are waiting for buses and will be waiting for buses until 7, 8 o'clock tonight. But you see, the government, they, they're so comfortable that they've forgotten how life works. Because that mother and father that will not get home until 8 o'clock tonight because they couldn't get a bus. The children, if they live within walking distance, will have been home probably since 3.30. And the children who are in the bus stand waiting until the same 8 o'clock 
have to push with adults to get the few buses that, buses that exist. Mm -hmm. So you got mother and father and child getting home at 8 o'clock. Somewhere in there, the, old, the mother has to cook, clean, take care of, and prepare for the next day. The child probably has to do homework. The parent has an opportunity to go to the PTA, the PTA meeting. Does this government truly understand what they are doing to our society when you can allow two, the, the number of buses on the road to drop from 220 to a trifling 60? 60 buses to service all of Barbados? 60 buses. 60 buses. You are destroying families. You are destroying the health of individuals. You are destroying the children's ability to learn. And then you will wonder why it is that we have so much indiscipline among our young people. And the Attorney General could, could deliver of himself such, <laughs> such rubbish <laughs> as to tell the country that he is bringing to Parliament in two weeks a law to make parents liable for the crimes of their children. <laughs> Such, such, such fecal coliforms. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Deputy <laughs> Speaker, we, we can dispense with all of this, all of this stuff. We are here, we are here only as an exercise which would allow the government to spend money post March 31st. That's the only reason we are here. We are not here because there's any economic promised land coming from the Dems. We are not here because there's anything in these estimates that will spark anybody's imagination or build anybody's hope or confidence about a Barbados and a brighter tomorrow. This is an exercise in checking the box. Simple, simple. We have to have estimates passed by March 31st and this government could care less what is in it or what is out of it. Mm -hmm. As long as they are able to cobble together some numbers, present them to parliament, pass it in the, res in the appropriate appropriations bill, then they have carte blanche to spend after March 31st. But where will Barbados be? Where will Barbados be? We are now whether the minister likes it or not. We are now a broken people. That is what we have come to. There's an old prayer, and I don't do a lot of praying. It's an old prayer. And <laughs> it, it says this, Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Chairman, to those who are hungry, grant them bread. And to those who have bread, grant them hunger for justice. And in the words of this simple prayer, it just tries to tell us that first let us feed our people. First let us take care of the needs of our people. And when we have been able to take care of the needs of our people, then let us focus on justice, economic justice, societal justice, the rule of law. Yep. None of those things, Madam Deputy Speaker, will mean anything, will mean anything, if in our financial affairs this country is rendered bankrupt. And I have no confidence that the Democratic Labour Party is doing anything to take us in a upward direction. The Democratic Labour Party is insisting, they're persistent in their efforts to make sure that Barbados becomes a bankrupt and a broken society, and I do not support these estimates.